everybody, this is Brittany. Welcome back to my channel. This will be the third and final installment in my GMO series. And in this video, I'll be sharing with you my sort of more general thoughts on GMOs. And since I do have several thoughts, I'll split this video into a couple uh, categories. Before I start, I'll just say that if you haven't seen the first two videos of this series, I highly encourage you to go see them. I'll put the science one up there, and from the science one you can go and see the myths one. They'll just help you have a better idea of what I'm talking about now. I guess when it comes to safety, the big thing for me is that I don't think of it as a sort of one-size-fits-all thing. Not all GMOs are the same. I don't believe that the process of genetic modification is inherently unsafe or could be inherently unsafe. I explain the science behind that. Genetic modification is a tool and tools are used in all kinds of different ways. And so that's the way I look at GMOs. I think that every individual case should be judged on its own merits and circumstances rather than putting sort of a blanket statement that, you know, all GMOs are bad, all GMOs are unsafe. So to give an example, certain GMOs that I have absolutely no issue with, I think are excellent and I think really benefit uh, our current world a lot, is uh, examples such as golden rice. Golden rice is a rice that has been genetically modified to contain beta carotene, which is a nutrient, specifically a nutrient that can be a precursor to vitamin A. Our body can store and then convert that beta carotene as needed to vitamin A, which is a very important nutrient to our bodies, but definitely our eyes. That's how you may know vitamin A. And there are certain populations within the world who just live in areas where either they can't grow uh, certain uh, vegetables or, or food items that contain vitamin A or beta carotene or they're just uh, unfortunately too poor to, to be able to afford it. And as a result, these populations suffer from high amounts of blindness, especially in children, as well as high amounts of death due to vitamin A deficiency. Of course, rice is a staple in a lot of these areas. It's usually inexpensive. It's something that's very easy to get a hold of. So by bringing golden rice to these communities, you're really improving their quality of life. Now on the flip side, uh, for an example of a GMO that I am a little le leery of, that would be the Roundup Ready crops. To name a few, there's soy, corn, alfalfa, uh, a bunch of other ones. And basically the way that they've been genetically modified is that uh, the chemical that is ra makes up Roundup, which is primarily glyphosate, it targets a particular process within a plant and stops it from occurring. And that process is integral for the plant to stay alive. So by stopping that process, the plant cannot stay alive. And so what Roundup Ready crops have is that they have been genetically modified to basically have a process that is immune to that chemical. Now in this case, of course, it's not the genetic modification that uh, worries me. As I've explained, I'm not concerned about that process. What concerns me is the effect of the genetic modification, which is that now you have all these crops that are being doused in Roundup, which is a pretty strong herbicide. You could say that the advent of that GMO kind of encourages more liberal usage of herbicides. The companies that develop the genetically modified organisms can patent that as intellectual property. So when they sell seeds to a farmer and the farmer plants it, the farmer is not allowed to save those seeds for the next year. They are obligated to buy the seed again uh, from that company. So there is a broad concern with that. Food, which is something that nourishes us and is integral to our survival, you're putting it in the hands of, of companies. But coming to this as a gardener, my more specific concern in relation to that is the fact 
that it really negatively affects the future of seed saving. Seed saving is the process by which farmers can basically develop a strain of a crop that is more suited to their particular region. So what they would do is they would grow an open pollinated seed, they would observe the crops that grew, and they would ultimately determine which were the best producing crops, uh, whether they were more disease resistant, whether they were more vigorous, whether they tolerated maybe an early frost. They would pinpoint these specific plants and then they would save seed from those specific plants and they would then plant those seeds the next year and repeat the process again. And what this actually is, is a method by which you can create what's called a land race. A land race is basically a seed that has been selectively bred in a particular region so that that strain would be particularly successful in that particular region. The area of concern with GMOs is that a lot of plants are pollinated either by wind or by insects. So bees go to the male plant or the male part of the plant, gather the pollen, which is the male gametes, bring it over to the female part of the plants or the female plants. They deposit it in the female sex organ and pollinate that plant. Wind pollination is just when wind blows pollen from a male plant to uh, the sex organs of a female plant. And so if the trans gene, which is the sort of gene that makes a genetically modified organism genetically modified, if it's in the male gamete, which isn't always the case, but if it is, there's the potential for inadvertent pollination of female plants that you don't want to be pollinated with this trans gene. And the issue there is that if a farmer that is just maybe a couple fields down or the neighboring fields to a GMO field saves their seed for the next year, they may inadvertently be uh, saving GMO seed and when they plant it next year, they're basically doing something that's illegal. Now you may have heard of a few cases involving Monsanto, which is a big bioag company that has a lot of patents for G uh, Roundup Ready GMO specifically, and how they've sued a couple farmers for having their seed on their premises when those farmers didn't actually buy the seed from Monsanto. Now Monsanto has said that if there's just a little bit of uh, genetically uh, modified seed that's found, then they'll give an allowance for, you know, accidental pollination. But I want to talk specifically about a particular case, and that's a case of a Canadian farmer who was successfully sued by Monsanto because 98% of it, their canola was this Roundup Ready canola and they had never purchased it from Monsanto. Now, of course, what was argued in court was that this person's field was, you know, 98% Roundup Ready canola, so obviously they knew what they were doing when they were saving seed from the previous year. They had spotted that some of the plants in their field were resistant to Roundup, and they thus saved that seed specifically with the intention of planting it the next year. Whether or not what he had done was intentional, I think this still speaks a lot to the future of agriculture and seed saving in particular. It really casts into doubt how people might go about seed saving. That's what he did. He looked at his, at his crops, he found the best producing ones, he took that seed. That is seed saving. And you could argue that he should have known that those plants being Roundup resistant must have been contaminated with the Roundup Ready gene, but I would argue that there has already been an instance of a weed called pigweed that has naturally developed a resistance to Roundup. And thus, I don't see why it's the farmer's responsibility to determine whether the Roundup resistance of, their, of his plants has to do with natural mutation or the uh, contamination by uh, GMO transgenes. Because then the question becomes, can we really seed save? 
going into the future. Can we feel safe going out and saying this is the best producing plant, we'll take seed from there? Or do we need to constantly second guess ourselves and go, hmm, this is the best producing one, but maybe that's because pollen was trans with the trans gene came in from a neighboring field. We don't know and we don't want to be sued. Is there a future for seed saving in a society where there is a lot of genetically modified organisms? I think that in future cases, it should be the company's responsibility to stop their genetic material from getting out. The thing is, it's actually, it can be done. For instance, with the example of sugar beets, which I talked about briefly in my MISS video, they actually specifically made sure that the trans gene is always in the female gamete, never in the male gamete. Of course, the female gamete doesn't travel, so there's no possibility of the trans gene getting into other beets. So there are ways that companies can ensure that their patented genetic material doesn't get out. And if they don't want their genetic material getting out, they should take the appropriate measures to make sure it doesn't get out. And if it does get out, then that's just the consequence that they have to accept that comes with them not doing a good enough job. And then maybe that will be incentive for them to do a better job. You can say what you want about uh, farmers you know, taking advantage, farmers knowingly stealing uh, the patented property, but I just think it's dangerous ground to expect farmers to know the difference between genetic mutations, which are random and are the basis of selective breeding, and contamination of their crop by neighboring genetically modified crops. And this sort of brings me into my next point. Right now we have such a wealth of diversity in the types of plants we have and the types of vegetables we can grow. Uh, the seed catalog that I like to get my seeds from, they had 1800 varieties last year, but I'm pretty sure they have since developed more. And this is really awesome because you can get such a variety of different traits. Maybe you like uh, less acidic tomatoes and orange tomatoes, less acidic than a red tomato. Maybe you want a meatier tomato that has less seeds. Swiss chard and beets, they are the same species. The thing is that Swiss chard is a strain that has been selectively bred for more leaves, less root. Beets, on the other hand, have been selectively bred for less leaves and more root. So that's a really good example of the wide, wide variety of uh, different plants that we've achieved through selective breeding. And so one of the concerns I have with GMOs, but not, not inherently from GMOs, but rather the growing dependence that our ag system could have on GMOs in the future is the drastic shrinking of that diversity. It would be way too expensive to genetically modify all these different varieties, so they only have one variety that they've genetically modified, and that's the variety that every farmer has to use if they want their Roundup Ready crop. It has no adaptability. You have this wide variety of different climates in, say, North America. Normally with selective breeding and with the ability of the individual to have total control over that, that then that individual is able to selectively breed strains that do well in their particular environment. And so with GMOs, where you can only have that one genetically mod modified variety, you just have to try and grow it anywhere. One of the other concerns is that if genetic modification becomes a much more commonly used technology in the agriculture sector, then you have to pose the question of, are we going to lose some of the great variety of strains that we have. Do we have people who are preserving them for future generations? So those are three different categories through which I could, I was thinking about GMOs. And so now I want to give you my general idea about GMOs, which is that I think that GMOs have their place. GMOs have their place, heirlooms have their place, they can coexist. As I mentioned with the golden rice, GMOs can do great things and can be a great benefit to this world because they serve specific purposes. 
heirlooms are great in terms of the diversity that they offer, the fact that they present different traits for people living in different climates or who want different things from their vegetables. And so to me, GMOs and heirlooms have very specific different uses and thus can coexist with perhaps some precautions. For instance, sugar beets and the fact that they were genetically engineered so that the trans gene was only in the female gamete. I think it would be great if more companies could do that with their genetically modified organisms. So I want to finish this video on a cautionary tale. You see, I did go to the University of Guelph and did a science degree and so I heard from my professors about a project that the University of Guelph was involved in. They nicknamed the EnviroPig, which was a genetic modification project uh, centered around pigs. And they had uh, successfully uh, genetically modified a line of pigs to produce the phytase enzyme. So in swine production, pigs are fed a particular diet, uh, usually a well-balanced diet that has been formulated to fulfill all the pigs dietary needs. And one of those dietary needs is phosphorus. Phosphorus is very important in the growth of pigs, so it's very important to a farmer to get that level of phosphorus right. But something you have to contend with is the fact that the majority of phosphorus in plant matter is held in this sort of complicated molecule called phytate, and phytate is extremely difficult to digest especially for pigs. And so what that means is it's absorbed at a very low efficiency by the pig and a lot of the phosphorus in the form of phytate is just going straight through the digestive tract and ending up in the manure. Because it's digested at such a low efficiency, farmers have to give a higher amount of phosphorus in, their, in the pig's diet to allow for that low efficiency. And that means that a significant amount of phytate is, ends up in the environment. And this is a cause for concern because phosphorus pollution is a problem. And so this EnviroPig project was all about genetically modifying a pig so that it has the gene for the phytase enzyme. Phytase is the enzyme that would successfully break down phytate and allow the pig to uh, absorb all the phosphorus. So the pig is able to digest all the phosphorus, the farmer has to give less phosphorus, which means that it's cheaper for the farmer. It also means less phosphorus is going into the environment, including the environment. It's a win for, win for everybody. Obviously there was a ton of research that went into this, tons of trials, tons of safety trials, and everything, everything was done by the book. Unfortunately, you know, towards the end of the project, some anti-GMO groups got wind of it and started this whole smear campaign uh, talking about how genetic modification is awful and would poison us and blah blah blah. Next thing you know, the government agency that was providing a large amount of the funding for the project pulls out their funding and as a result the project can't continue. And because the EnviroPig was never approved to be released to the public, it means basically everything surrounding the EnviroPig had to be destroyed. So here's something that really represented a great step forward in terms of environmentally friendly agriculture. And it was shut down and not allowed to be carried out to fruition simply because of some kind of hysterical notions of what kind of dangers it could potentially have. There really wasn't anything informed or educated about the uh, concerns that the opposition to the project had. So I just want to caution you guys, go ahead, be skeptical, question, that's totally fine. Just be reasonable about it. Make sure that you're reacting to objective facts and knowledge, not emotion and anecdotal evidence. And lastly, please consider the idea that GMOs might have their place in this world and it just might not be with you. Just because you don't find GMOs useful or beneficial does not mean other communities won't. After all, not everybody has the same circumstances. 
Sometimes people live in circumstances that means that they would benefit from a GMO. You might not be that person. So thank you very much for watching this entire video. I know it was a bit long. I had a lot of different thoughts and I wanted to make sure that I thoroughly articulated them to you guys. I really hope you guys learned something or were exposed to an idea that perhaps you hadn't thought of. If you disagree with anything I've said, please let me know in the comments. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in seeing more, please hit that subscribe button. And if you think that any of your friends might be interested in this series on GMOs, uh, please share it with them. I hope you guys have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.